some questions for you because I know you have a lot of good information. And the first question I'd like to ask you is about your connection to procurement, which is also the title of this podcast. Um, so how did procurement find you? Well, it, it's and hi Susan, hello everyone. Um, it's it's a good question because it didn't. Um, uh, so I've been asked that question before. I'm one of the few people, uh, I think, that actually went out and found procurement. Um, so I didn't fall into procurement. Wow. It was it was a conscious choice to 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 go into procurement for for a number of reasons. Um, I guess my my father being a salesman um, <laughs> and and compl complaining about buyers. Um, <laughs> made me think oh, that's interesting isn't it that, that's a way to really antagonize your father uh, is to go into the profession that he doesn't doesn't that he talks about a little bit so that was that was a reason as well and and during um sort of university well not university during during a college course that I was that I was doing uh there was uh, some work experience that they that they did as part of it and you kind of went through all the different parts of a retail organization and part of that was actually working in in the procurement function purchasing as it as right, it was yeah, as it was back in the, in the 1980s when i when yeah. i started and i really enjoyed it i thought there was, there was a lot of interesting things there and working working in a warehouse uh, and understanding the goods in the goods out procedure mm -hmm. and and seeing how they reordered things and seeing how they brought stock in and and, and then got it ready for sale and what have you all mm -hmm. of that stuff from the broader Sort of procurement family if you like made me go you know i think this is the profession that i that i really want to go into and so i i found a role in in procurement with the national health service and it went from there oh that's fantastic and it is exciting because yeah the, i think people are starting to find procurement themselves more often now um because people starting to know about it and it is seen more as a real profession but yeah you know not that long ago when it was you know purchasing um i think that's it's probably right that procurement did find a lot of people later, but you are one of the originals, so that is cool. Yeah, and yeah well, we'll try, <laughs> try and be different, right? That's my that's a motto. Try and be different. Absolutely. So um, I noticed, you know, that your catchphrase is "procurement can save the world," which I absolutely love. I want to adopt that myself. But can you tell me more about that? How that came about? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think I think procurement done well. Uh, can impact so many different things of an organization, of public sector, of therefore people's life. I think mm. procurement done badly can also save the world yeah. for, for completely yeah. different reasons, right? Yeah, right. Um, so it, it can be, um, and, and this is part of, of something that, that I feel very passionate about, procurement is so much more than, than just saving money, just cost savings. Um, it can fundamentally change the nature of what a market looks like. It can understand mm. in a monopoly or a duopoly or an oligopoly, what the impacts are of that and therefore what's needed to get done to change that. It can look at mm. the way that it sources and try and drive diversity in its sourcing. It mm. can it can impact and affect organisational strategy about some of the things that they choose to buy by bringing knowledge, by bringing awareness, by bringing light, if you like, in, in terms of the decisions that are about to be made. So, you know, one of the things that I, I talk about and used to talk a lot about in, in training was being aware of the impact of the decision you're about to make before you make it. Mm. And start to scenario plan some of those some of those things. And what I think has become evident over the last three or four years is that the lack of scenario planning has massively impacted organisations. They haven't done the what if mm. analysis. There was always another supplier. There was always another choice until yeah. there isn't. Yeah. And and so some of the research that that I've been conducting now actually clearly identifies that that some of the drivers that organisations are looking for is to increase scenario planning. Well, mm. who's better to do that? Who can really impact the scenario planning by by accessing those, those those external markets and making decisions and impacting decisions around whether or not you outsource something, you bring it in house. Yeah. For instance, if you wanna if you wanna stimulate some economy right now, one of the things that many governments do, obviously, is they build infrastructure. That's a that's a way yeah. that pretty much Classic. every yeah. country around the world you do big infrastructure projects and australia is no different i live in victoria yeah. it's the big build there's more things being mm. built in this country in this state than you can possibly imagine but the, the problem that you got got then is it's that has a massive impact on all of the different suppliers and sub suppliers and sub sub suppliers and, yeah. and associated suppliers of these things that can happen and so you can actually turn around now and go well there are pockets in here that we're just not going to be able to get supply of so how do we think differently? Well, one of the ways to think differently is to insource and bring apprenticeships and do all sorts of weird and wonderful things that are going to solve that problem. And that's that's the reason why I think that procurement can save the world, because it really can impact economies and it yeah. touches more parts of any organization 
um, of every organization and any organization, probably safe for IT than any other part of a business. Hmm. Because everybody needs something to buy and yeah. everybody needs to understand external supply markets. And that's why I think procurement can really impact and, and, and change the world and, and save the world um, because it can start to drive a broader agenda uh, that people need to consider by showing people what those what those broader agendas can be. Yeah, no, that's that's really good because certainly that plays into the whole ESG, you know, flavor of the moment, which hopefully will continue on, you know, forever. But yeah, also that whole thing about, as you said, onshoring and reshoring and training up our own people, which for me here in Australia, that's always been one of the things that upsets me that we always bring in, and here we are, two people not originally from Australia, but, you know, uh, bringing in people from overseas to do jobs, you know, that people in Australia trained up could easily do. But, yeah, no, that's, um, thank you for sharing that. I think that is a mantra that we can all um, look at. Maybe I'll have my next podcast called Procurement Can Save the World. Thank you. I might pinch that from you. Um, so the one that I had before was Procurement is Life, which I stole outrageously from Ted Lasso. So, um, oh, okay. Not well, procurement is life, it was football is life. But I right, thought, right, but I, yeah, I, there, I, you I that, but there you go. Well, look, you know, very few people, can I say, have really original thoughts. We do like to steal from one another. So, But yes. I, I appreciate that thought, procurement can save the world, and I am going to steal it. Um, now, I know you talked about how you found, um, you know, well, how, sorry, well, how you decided to go into procurement. Um, but I guess, did you want to share, you know, a few of the highlights for, of your career trajectory so far? Oh, well, yeah, I mean... The, the, the cool thing is, as you know, as, as hopefully the people listening will know will, will know a little bit about me and certainly gather from the accent. Um, I've uh, worked in lots of different continents, um, and seeing the differences is, is always interesting. So you know, growing up in England uh, and starting my procurement career in England, I guess one of the, one of the big highlights for me in that one was uh, Oyster Card. So I oh, yeah. was the, the lead procurement guy. Uh, for the Oyster Car transformation that took it from what we all call as a transport ticket to mm. essentially as a, as a cash replacement system. In many ways, it was the forerunner of what we uh, what we have now is the, the you know the payless transact the the, the touchless yeah. transaction. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and and so being exposed to to that business strategy um, in terms of what the goals were behind it, uh, mm. being involved, being exposed to essentially the world of corporate finance. And the world of technology. Um, mm. I can honestly say that that was a, a two-year project that I, I kind of worked on, and I, I think you learn something every day. I mm. think it, it it massively impacted the way that I did conduct future um, market interactions. Uh, I'm not right. going to say the word tender. I'm not going to say the word RFP yeah. because one of the yeah. reasons is is that I don't the future market interactions never involve an RFP. So this this was a government piece of legislation, this is a government piece of procurement transaction, and we issued no tender documents. All right. Because you were looking for someone innovative? Was that, you know, yeah. you're looking for a new, because new you wanna, arrangement? Exactly. If you want to stifle innovation, send out a tender. Mm. <laughs> Sadly. Um, but <laughs> and, uh, and so we basically, you know, had just held constant competitive dialogues. And it was just recognizing that we can we can achieve the outcomes that we want to achieve without being stuck in issuing a document and getting someone to issue a document to our requirements. Because yes. again, yeah. part of this is if we're looking for innovation, surely part of the evaluation should be how innovative their responses are. If you're yeah. looking for a, a, an indicator as to how innovative this organization is, how creative this organization is, then getting them to fill a 20 page document in, in the same way as everybody else, to make it easier for you, to me, just strike. You don't want to do that. Um, no. And the reality is, if if that's how we're going to make a decision, there's technology that does that. We don't need human interaction. Um, yeah, so yeah. so so you so that that's kind of one of the things that I learned from that. So so that was a that was a highlight. Coming to Australia and working as a consultant for a period of time was 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 a highlight because again you saw so many different uh, different organisations uh, and so many different things that they were doing and and again recognising that this. This cookie cutter singular approach to things it does need you need to have some uh, nuance within within these things and and, mm. and recognizing that that people think differently is is good and then I'd, I'd say the other part that I, I always really enjoyed was the the delivering of the of the learning delivering of the training um, to help, well, we obviously well that's where we met of course um, Gordon yeah. so yeah yeah uh, so so delivering all those training touching 
um, or, or being able to, to influence so many people in a, at a stage of their career where they're looking to do things fun and interesting in procurement and to see so many of them uh, go on to lead procurement functions and mm -hmm. to hear them uh, say some of the things that I was talking about in these training programs, you know, it's, it is, it is fantastic to kind of to kind of see all those things and people reaching back out. And even if it is just to reiterate some of the very, very poor jokes uh, that they would have heard <laughs> and experienced on those courses. We love your uh, jokes, Gordon. <laughs> but, I, but I think it was good. It, so it was, it's really nice to always see that this constancy of um, people in, in procurement leadership roles that I see now that, that eight, nine years ago at the beginning of their career and you see how they move and you see them going that that is something that I think is a constant source of enjoyment for me is to see the success of other people yeah yeah the fruits of, of that and, and of them and your you know involvement so now that's great I um, mean that kind of leads me to um, one of my um, next questions which I mean I met you on a category management course you know seems like years ago now and I certainly learned heaps in that course and it was you know and now it seems like category management is supposedly what everybody does, although I would argue that a lot of times it's really just strategic sourcing. But anyway, um, leaving that where I, I found it, um, I'm just going to say that I know one of your um, recent research topics has been on the subject of the evolution of spend management. And I'd love to hear more about that, particularly around why you're now looking at the concept of spend management as opposed to procurement or category management or you know, something else. And OK, so I think the, the reason why we, we would call it spend management is similar to what what you just said, actually, Susan, is that I think the connotation of procurement um, is that it's about sourcing. Um, so yeah. um, it's interesting being, being in a global role um, and being exposed to, to different parts of the world. It's always interesting to hear the terminology that gets used. And mm -hmm. so in, in the US, for instance, procurement is basically what we would call P2P. Right. OK. And, and <laughs> Whereas it's, here in Australia, it's, it's sourcing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah that's and, interesting. Whereas, and, and so sourcing is sourcing and procurement is is purchase to bank. That's basically right. what, right. they, what they look at, which is which is interesting. And of course, growing up in England, P2P is, is, would still be what we would call purchasing. I mean, that's one of my first Correct. jobs yeah. in, in procurement was in purchasing, converting yeah. requisitions to purchase orders through using yeah. a catalogue um, yeah. and all those things that, that you, we still do, except that it took six weeks in 1988, yeah. 89, and it hopefully can take less than six hours in, in 2023. Um, Absolutely. Like you don't need those big books of catalogues anymore, any yeah, of that stuff. So, yeah, it's yeah. all digitized. Yeah. So the reason why I say spend management is because I, and the reason why we say I say within SAP spend management is because it's broader than just purchasing or procurement. It's broader than just sourcing. Um, it's broader than just just category management. It's broader than just inventory management. It's broader than just invoice management. It's broader than just expense management. All of these different parts mm -hmm. make up spend management. When you're thinking about total spend. Um, you have to think about where all of the spend comes from. And the first thing I'd say is, you know, being a, a procurement practitioner, we don't cover all the spend. No. There's chunks of spend out there that we don't cover. But if you want to take a holistic view to understand where the organization is spending money, you need to have a total spend piece rather than mm. a total procurement piece. Yeah, so that, that would be something that I, I would say is be, be really cognizant of all the spend. Not that we have to control or manage all the spend, but we have to be aware of all of the spend so we know what the trends are within the organization. If we're truly mm. to align, we really need to understand that. I think that's 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 the first, first piece as to why spend management. And the second bit I'd say is exactly what you were saying, that um, I think category management done, done well um, transforms organizations and transforms functions mm. the what i've the the risk of category management is that essentially what it is what it is currently in large large parts of organizations that it is actually category segmentation right. it's a way to segment um spend into mm. different categories and allocate yeah. resources to it and yeah. the reality is 90 percent of the time it ends up in a sourcing exercise yeah 100 percent if 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 procurement wants to not be famous for cost saving, mm. it's got to take some bold approaches. This is and this is a view that, that I hold, mm. uh, and one of those bold approaches could be to issue no RFPs. I'm not saying yeah. that no one ever issues RFPs, but I'm saying the business users can do that. If we take a look at HR five years ago, ten years ago, 
they were involved in what we would call tactical um, events such as recruiting, yeah. such as potentially performance management. And what they did was that they realized actually technology is going to come along and do all those things, which it does. It absolutely yeah. does. Now. And yeah. so they pushed that tactical stuff back towards the cost center manager. Mm. There's lots of sourcing that the reality is is tactical. Um, I have a little thing that says if you've got to put the word strategic before something, it's not strategic. <laughs> Yeah, I take that point. Yeah, because you're, you're, you're giving it a label that it shouldn't actually need. It, it, it just strategic. It's like sticking a word before unique. Unique yeah. means one yeah. of a kind. It doesn't have to yeah. be really unique. It just means it's one of a kind. Yeah. Sourcing can be strategic, but labeling it strategic means that it probably it isn't. isn't. And that's a really good point because I have heard these kinds of conversations about sticking the word strategic in there rather than operational or something yeah. just recently. So, yeah, so, yeah. And there's nothing wrong with, with, with sourcing. There's nothing wrong yeah. with RMPs. There's nothing wrong with that. My point is, if we want to concentrate on the things where we think we can add significantly more value, then we need to actually do the things that can add significantly more value and let go of the things that we don't. And some mm. of those things are running sourcing campaigns. And I know right. many organizations have got thresholds. I would be, my five-year vision would be remove the threshold. To run saying, no, all RFPs, the goal is in five years' time, all RFPs are run by the business, and we put technology in there that helps them run them. We put the mm. policy in the process. Let me tell you, on user experience, I've just done a piece of research, and it identified the user experience was a key driver of digital transformation. And then I asked the question, so what is it about user experience? And the answer came back, it's people. It's actually yeah. about relationship and alignment with organizations. It's it's not, the technology's got to play with it. The pro, The lowest answer was policy. Right. The lowest answer about improving user experience was policy. Yeah, a lot of the time we talk about we've got to get the policy right. Yeah, we don't. Sure. We have to get the relationships right. We have to get the alignment with the business right. That's what we've got to get right if we want people to, to really use our services and recognize what we do. So yeah. for me, a lot of it is if we um, if we want to do something different, we have to like let go of the things that we've been doing. And part of that is to have this holistic view of spend management and recognize actually where we can add value is not – running RFPs, where we can add value is so deeply understand, and this is what category management done well is, is having a forward-looking view as to what things are impacting this category, what it means for this category, and bringing that to our business partner, bringing that to our, you know, if we've got business partnering, which is what HR do, they have the business mm. partner now that helps organizations set strategy, is bringing that to these business partners, bringing that to the, to the users, and helping them set their acquisition strategy, helping mm. them think about what it means. And then yeah. Yeah, maybe it's a case of, well, we're going to have to do something so strategic in the market, like bring a new supplier in. How are we going to bring a new supplier? You're not going to bring a new supplier in through a tender. No. <laughs> you're going to bring a new supplier in because you're going Especially to be Especially a restricted deep. tender, yeah, <laughs> where exactly. you already know everybody. <laughs> so I think we have to do something you know, fundamentally different. And that's, that's why I say, let's set some big goals of, of no tenders. Let's set another goal of not measuring cost savings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's let's pretty set those, goals. <laughs> let's set those goals, because if we want to do something different, if we want to measure the impact of what we do and we want to be famous for something that's not cost savings and stop measuring it. Yeah, well, that's, start, yeah, that's, that's radical. <laughs> well, start measuring your contribution to revenue. Right. Yeah, that's um, I remember you or somebody talking about that. That's kind of a new frontier for procurement. So, yeah, that's um, let's let's measure the business value that we bring because the risk is that you know and i work for a technology company um so i see what's coming from a technology perspective mm. you know the risk is is that in the same way how many how many procurement teams now convert requisitions to purchase orders <laughs> well i don't think that's what we do in the procurement team is it <laughs> no i don't think it is <laughs> it's done automatically it's done yeah. by technology 100 percent. yeah I, I would suggest that it's going to go the same way. The same way with sources. sourcing, yeah. But understanding the supply base, understanding the relationship, having a deep understanding of what impacts these things are happening. Take um, a, a good example is, is Toyota, actually. Um, the, the doyen, if you like, of lean manufacturing, um, of just in time, of holding no stock. Um, after the Fukushima earthquake, they took a, took a look back and went, hang on a minute, if... If there's a shortage of semiconductors, we've got a massive issue. So why are we keeping a weak supply of semiconductors? Yeah. Oh, hang on a minute. And they basically they re, they restructured their entire inventory yeah. management system because they started to scenario plan. 
Now, if because, you want time to scenario plan, you can't be running a tender. No. And they were like the kings of just in time, weren't they? But now it's the whole different philosophy with different, um, you know, got a, different world I, I, situations. I was at an event in Tokyo a few years ago, and uh, one of the, and it been translated because I can't speak Japanese, um, but it was um, one of the, the speakers turned around and just said, we've missed an opportunity for the last 10 years because we've been so focused on on controlling costs and controlling inventory and controlling all those different points that we've missed the opportunity for innovation and supplier management and supplier relationships. We've missed all of that opportunity. And that's that's where we should be investing our time rather than worrying about essentially tactical things that you can automate. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. I mean, yeah, that's really insightful and, and, and did you, exciting. Did you see that there was a Harvard Business Review article and it talked about Walmart, and they have put in place negotiation chatbots to carry out negotiations with their suppliers. Right. Yeah. And um, wow, that's and also I've heard of things like not that particularly, which is amazing, but also the fact that yeah, you can get to things much quicker if you let the computer do the negotiating and say what's your goal, what's your goal, match up the goals. So that's and that's really happening, as you said. Walmart's doing it already. And type in, have a look at, and if people haven't, have a look at ChatGPT. Oh, I I wrote my daughter a poem using ChatGPT. <laughs> Much better than I could have done, I can tell yeah, you. It's it's very interesting to see that. Um, I mean, there's still there's still issues with it, clearly. But in terms of, you know what I mean? And that's why I'm saying around that the technology is going to come and do the stuff anyway. So if, mm. if procurement wants to save the world, if it, if it can't, then it has to kind of change what it does and what it's famous for. Um, and yeah. that, that's why I just want to say we've got to set these goals that, you know, if any anyone going in now five years time should say, I don't want to run RFPs within the sourcing team, that actually I just want to put that to the business. What I want to do is enable the business with the strategies, mm -hmm. with understanding what's going on so they can do that and so that I can be more better aligned with the organization. Yeah, 100%. No, I love that, Gordon. And look, I know we don't have all day, even though I'd love to chat to you all day because you have so many very interesting and insightful things to say. Maybe I'll have to make a podcast series just with you, Gordon. <laughs> um, um, but I, look, I'm, I think your viewership or your listenership might go down. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Well, I'd listen anyway. So look, um, yeah, I just want to um, say, look, uh, is there anything that you, you wanted to add about, you know, yourself or your life or anything just quickly before we go? Any other key branding platforms or anything? Um, what excites you about coming to work? Anything? I, mean, I think the thing that excites me about coming to work is the is the, the fact that I can go and do these research activities um, and understand what the future of procurement looks might look like by by listening to a lot of people and carrying out surveys and and interpreting what it means and carrying out other specific research pieces. So the exposure to a lot of global thinkers who think differently about both the world and, and procurement is is fantastic, and the fact that I can try and bring that mesh of procurement and technology together um mm -hmm. because every function is being impacted by, from technology by technology every single 100%. function yeah, minutes. Yeah. what it is direct indirect whatever it is technology yeah. is changing the way that we do everything and so to be at the the cutting edge of how procurement and technology meet for me that's that's exciting it's uh yeah. it's it's great to be able to and again to to influence um the people that i work with around actually this is what procurement really needs so yes. let's start yes. making sure that this sort of stuff happens. This um, happens that yeah. sort of stuff is, is fun and exciting. Oh, well, thank you so much, Gordon. I've really appreciated you coming and having a chat with me and, um, yeah, and sharing some of your insights and your ideas. And I'm sure that people will be very interested in hearing this podcast. So thank you so much and um, have a lovely weekend, as we've discussed, and I'm sure we will be in touch. We, it's good to, to speak to you and to see you on the on the teams, and I look forward to seeing you in in real life at some point soon. Yeah. Alrighty. Okay. Thanks again, Gordon. See you then. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.